Thanks so much for joining the Future of Sheltering with Dr. Ellen Jefferson and Kristen Hassan. This webinar tonight is sponsored by Animal Arts. Thank you so much to our sponsor. And throughout the webinar, you can use the chat function to ask questions or the Q&A function as well. Um, and take it away. Wow, thank you. Um, hi everybody, my name is Kristen Hassan Auerbach and I'm the director of Pima Animal Care Center in Tucson, Arizona. I also sit on the board of directors for the National Animal Control Association and I'm on the executive committee of American Pets Alive. So I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Hi, I'm Ellen Jefferson. I am the director, executive director of Austin Pets Alive and American Pets Alive. And I'm also really excited to be here and really thankful to Animal Arts for sponsoring our webinar. Thank you so much, Animal Arts. Okay, so we're going against every rule we ever follow with PowerPoints um, tonight. And we wanna get you as much information. So we're gonna apologize in advance because there are a lot of words on the screens we're gonna see. And that's just because we know so many of you are trying to move quickly and we wanna get you information in every format we can. So this will be recorded and you'll be able to watch it later, but uh, we're gonna be sharing what we think the future of sheltering is gonna look like. So uh, this is a document and a concept that is changing day by day as we envision a new world for homeless pets. So we're really excited to share it with you. All right, let's get started. So we begin our journey um, with a quick trip back in history to 1909 when then President Teddy Roosevelt, um, he made a proclamation that children had a inherent right to live in homes and that children shouldn't be housed in orphanages. And at this time in the US, there were still so many children housed in orphanages. And he really at this 1909 meeting on, uh, conference on children, he really completely changed the way that homeless kids were housed. And this is a quote from him, but he lets us know that he believes the best way to care for dependent children is in a family home and that orphanages should be discontinued. And this not only changed everything for kids without immediate parent and caregivers to take care of them, it changed everything for them and it, it created a large foster system um, that now houses most kids. And it also was the beginning of the modern social work movement. So what has this led to today? For kids, there are currently more than 400,000 kids in human foster care in the US. 29% uh, are in relatives homes and 46% are in non-relative homes. And 51% of children in foster care are reunited with their parents or caregivers. And about a third of those are age 13 or older. So there are a lot of lessons to be learned here for animal welfare, but we envision a world where most pets are housed in foster or simply kept in the community. And so by following some of the lessons we've learned from human social work um, and social services and this amazing thing that happened in 1909, we can apply some of that to animal welfare. Um, of note, this all happened in 1909, which it's been on my mind all day that the 1918 flu pandemic would have had such a more devastating impact on kids had they been housed in orphanages. And instead, by that time, most kids in the US were housed in homes and were safe and sound during that pandemic. So interesting. So um, now we, we get to present day and um, in our world and what's happened in the last, you know, week, three weeks, four weeks, um, whenever it started for you, is that um, it's made it impossible for us to care for animals in a, in a building where they're all together because that means people have to be all together too. And so it's been really great that we can, um, that we have this moment in time where we can actually think a little bit differently. And um, another thing that I think is really outstanding that Kristen has mentioned several times on these calls is that shelter systems actually did pivot and save lives when in the past it would have been an automatic death sentence for most of the animals in the shelter because people all of a sudden are kind of barred from coming in. And um, that pivot has completely changed how we're thinking about shelters and how we're envisioning the future and how I think our communities are too. Wouldn't you agree, Kristen? 
Yeah, it was like in this moment of uh, total upheaval of everything that we know, the movement was going to turn to what it knew. It was going to turn to what was laying around. And in the old days, if this happened 20 years ago, what would have been laying around as an idea would have been simply mass euthanasia. There would not have been any other ideas that were enough in people's imaginations they could happen. But thanks to the last five to 10 years of innovation in foster care and community programming, we had a lot of other stuff lying around and we're able to pick it up and implement it in huge numbers really, really quickly. Um, and so it, when we think about what has happened here, we've had a true disruption to the sheltering system. Um, we've had to sort of say this old way, at least in this moment of COVID, this old way of sheltering is obsolete. It is not gonna work and our communities are not gonna tolerate, nor would we ever accept having to euthanize healthy, friendly, treatable animals in this moment. And uh, I remember early on in COVID, I was talking to my staff about what if we have to euthanize for space? This was probably three and a half weeks ago, but it feels like years ago. And I said, we really need to start thinking about what it's gonna look like if we have to euthanize animals for space because we're so full and no one's adopting. And they came back to me in no more than an hour and they said, you know that we would all collectively refuse to do that. And at that moment, you know, even I was sort of like thinking about going back to those old ways, but it was their, their sort of saying, no way, this is a new day that helped me move forward in this. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing. And I, I love this little um, picture on the right, because um, I feel like we have done so much innovation over the past, you know, Austin Pets Alive has been rescuing animals and working with sheltering animals for the last 12 years. And I feel like there's been so much innovation, but it is all trying to combat a system that never should have been continuing to this day anyway. And so this, um, we've been trying to make it better, but the foundation of it is so broken and so obsolete that it's hard to really make transformational change. Well, I guess that's the same thing, make a huge transformation. And so now with this disruption, we have no choice. But to, but to rethink how we do this, especially because the virus doesn't appear to be going away uh, anytime soon. So Ellen, can we talk a little bit about, so this presentation started off as six ways that you can increase life saving now. And what we want to assure everybody who is watching right now is we are going to tackle that and more. Um, but we wanted to give you sort of just some overall, it, this is a high level view of kind of where we started because we started talking about this a couple weeks ago, and these were the ideas that we started with. We just hadn't quite put them into um, a system yet. So I'll go through these ideas really quickly, and then um, Dr. Jefferson, you can add whatever you want. But um, the first is a one health approach. So the first thing is to really start to think about the hu that humans, pets, other animals, and the environment as one unit. So for example, um, uh, a quick illustration of this is in the old days of pack, we used to take in, um, it, it gets like to be about 120 degrees here in the summer. And when we had people experiencing homelessness with their dogs, their, the pads would get burned on the dog's paws. The old way of handling that was to take those dogs into the shelter system and separate them out from their owners and say, you, you know, you can't take proper care of this. Well, we have now that we take a one health approach to uh, what we do, Instead, we have literally been able to buy every single homeless dog in Tucson um, tennis shoes. And so whenever you see the um, dogs whose owners are experiencing homelessness walking around town, they're all wearing tennis shoes. And that's because we wanted to take an approach that valued the human animal bond and kept, kept pets together. So that's one tiny of example of the many, many ways we're employing that approach. Um, the second is that foster care becomes the primary means of housing animals, and this is sort of back to the 1909 shift that happened for kids, so it's now 111 years later, it's time to do it for pets. Uh, third, um, using a case management pro uh, pro approach for every single service we offer, rather than having really any blanket policies at all, treating every human and animal as if just like in social work, you have case management. This is the same. You're treating every human and animal and that, that unit as a case and they, as individuals who need a, maybe one, one person, their pet needs one thing, one needs another. Um, number four is a whole different kind of in, a community engagement with a focus on providing remote services, um, very, very low barriers to getting that service and quick and efficient service for the community. So actually this model makes 
us better uh, public servants and makes us better at serving pets and people. We're not taking anything away. We're actually adding to what we can give people. And uh, number five is that we look at a whole new set of functions and services that haven't existed before while we get rid of the old ones. So um, a good example of this is that instead of, uh, instead of a, a senior dog or a senior cat who is being surrendered uh, to the shelter, instead of that pet coming, just being brought in, carte blanche, maybe as an owner request for euthanasia, instead of that, we have a counselor that works with the uh, person attempting to surrender and they help give them resources and support. And if that person can't keep their pet, in some places people can't, that counselor will also help them rehome that pet themselves. So um, it's a whole new, we've never been able to offer anything like that and we're able to now. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, we need a total reallocation of uh, staff and volunteers um, and retraining to, to provide this whole new set of functions and to imagine, to really realize the new world we're imagining for pets. Yeah, I, and I think that our, you know, I think you hit the hit the uh, nail on the head with the idea of this being social services. Instead of us talking about animal services as a program that's completely separate from the people part of what government does, I think it's really important that we st start reframing this as animal um, social services so that there's there's an automatic connection to what we're doing with the people and pets together. There's a bond there and we need to be um, helping both sides of it. We're not, animal services doesn't make any sense. And I think that goes back to this old model that we created a long, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, and we've just been following it. And so we've morphed from, um, you know, I found an article in Austin paper that they called it the death house for animals. And we've morphed into the pound and then into the shelter and animal services is a, a name change, but it doesn't really change the fact that we're institutionalizing animals that don't need to be brought in and breaking the bond that exists with somebody out in the community without doing our due diligence to make sure that we can bolster that up first. And so, um, so anyway, I think that that's a key concept that is incredibly central to this whole idea. Well, and one of the things that you and I, Ellen, have been confronted with as we presented this, when, when people first see that list, they go, yeah, we're already doing all that every single time. And so the reason that we, we aren't just giving you that list and turning it over to conversation is we want to show you that you're not actually doing that, that actually what you need to do is vastly different than what you think. Um, and so the, this next part of the presentation is really intended to kind of show you what do we really mean when we say this reallocation of services and this whole new emphasis on housing most pets in the community. Yeah, and so this slide is just trying to show what, um, what we are currently doing. This is how most big communities, actually probably most communities work. There's some government appointed shelter that is um, in charge of taking care of all of these uh, little blue circles on the left, um, animals that are threatening public safety, that could be due to disease or rabies, um, animals that are involved in legal disputes, animals that are um, free roaming in the community, lost pets, and pets at risk of relinquishment. And they all funnel to this circle, the government shelter facility. And the problem with that is that because you're talking about the community all the, on the left, it, basically having their hands on all these animals and then they're funneling down to this smaller system where there's very few hands on them. And so once they get into this smaller circle, it's really, really, really labor intensive to get them out because there's no way that you can have the spread of support and resources that are, exist in the community within a shelter facility. There's just no way, even though like Kristen's a perfect example of a government facility that's really trying to bring people in and open it up, everything around transparency and letting volunteers help, letting fosters help. There's still no way that you can give those animals that sort of um, roundabout support that they can get in the community if they aren't taken to this little tunnel of the government shelter facility. And the other thing that I think is really striking is that um, when we're looking at data in a lot of these communities with high stray animal, stray populations, stray populations, they are, the, the intake needs aren't really changing. Um, we see changes in policy, like changes to not taking in cats, 
but if that policy hadn't changed, the cat numbers don't really move very much. And so I think that that should be a really good indicator to us that it's not working. Um, we're catching and killing is not working. And that's the same thing with cats and TNR. It doesn't work. So cats and cats and bring them into the shelter doesn't work. TNR works to help keep those um, spaces filled out in the community so that we're not just constantly chasing our tail on, on um, catching and killing or catching and releasing and, you know, if you have a progressive sh shelter. And I think part of what needs to happen here is that we need to recognize that we have all, some part of us has have believed that the institution was necessary, uh, uh, the way it operates and that, and, and I think I've been guilty of this too, of like, well, you know, I don't know what to say. 19,000 animals are coming into my shelter every year. And so what I think the first step to all of this and for everybody watching is that we really need to sort of mourn um, or let go of the meaning of that institution and think um, it's a little bit like uh, libraries. Libraries, when people stopped reading uh, hardcover books, libraries didn't know what to do and a lot of them just sort of kept doing the same thing. Um, their, their budgets weren't sufficient to do what they wanted and then libraries have rethought everything that they do and we're seeing these libraries of the future emerge that are so much so much more in tune with the needs of people and they have all kinds of digital resources but it really took a letting go of the old way and I think our first responsibility as leaders is to truly let go of that like to separate ourselves from thinking that's normal and to recognize that it's a crazy socially constructed system that does not need to exist in the way it does now. Do you want to speak to this? Uh, yeah, so you've heard us talk about One Health and um, you might wonder what that is. And we, we'll talk a little bit more about One Health um, later, but One Welfare is sort of an extension of One Health. Um, that's, and they have the One Welfare has a website that you can read all about it. But it's really this connection between people, animals, and the environment. And One Welfare is actually focused on animal welfare. So when you look at this umbrella, there's all of these things that connect, right? Um, and all of these it community issues, right? And so in, in the way we're handling it now, we're basically just tackling animals. So we're tackling animals as if none of these other things exist. And what, what, what One Health and One Welfare say are that there's everything is, is connected to everything else. So you can't just tackle animals. You can't just separate them out from the human problems. You have to look at the whole picture and try to solve the bigger problems. And so a lot of what we're talking about is looking at a more holistic community picture um, and understanding the connection between animals, uh, the environment and people. Yeah, so now in the new paradigm, what we're seeing right now um, with the temporary systems that are in place, um, trying to limit the number of animals coming into the, the government funded shelters. And so we're seeing that the animals that are still coming in are animals threatening public safety through disease, rabies, or being dangerous, animals still involved in legal disputes. But the door is closed on these other groups of animals and it's a temporary situation um, we don't know how temporary uh, i think all of us suspect it's going to be longer than you know weeks but um that means that we've got we've got to kind of deal with our present as we're also trying to figure out what the future is and right now we're we are seeing some um some difficulties with that of course we have a we have a safety net that's always existed in the community for people to bring their pets to. It's always the first place people go, the first, the first choice. And um, the um, and so there's a perceived loss of that safety net system. And that is a problem because there needs to be something to fill its place that's an alternative. And um, there's not yet because this is also happening so fast and the shelter has just kind of closed and we're all left wondering what we're gonna do but that doesn't mean that it can't exist in the future. And then the other thing that I think is a big problem is that um, as especially loose dogs are not picked up, there may be more bites that are happening in the community. And that's something that we don't know yet. Um, I think we've been reaching out, trying to find data from multiple municipalities to see if we can find some sort of trend up, down, or the same. Um, right now, anecdotally, we're hearing that it is not going up, which I think is really good. But um, but those are kind of the big threats that exist uh, with the system right now. 
And then as we start looking at the COVID leveraged system, and this is where we start thinking about, okay, what's the new horizon? What, what kind of system can we have? And we still need the government facility for the, the things that they're currently doing. And, but we need to start building resources around um, free roaming community animals where a lot of communities are already helping cats, but that's not, that doesn't help dogs. Dogs aren't, aren't perceived as a community animal, but in a lot of communities, they actually are. Um, lost pets, there needs to be a system for lost pets. If I lost one of my dogs or one of my pets, I, I would be distraught and would need to know where to go look. Um, and then pets at risk of relinquishment need a new system to support them or rehome and get them into a home. The, the ultimate goal is that we're, we're bypassing the institution, just the same as the orphanage, bypassing the institution where so many, um, not bad things is not the right terminology, but there's so much that is not possible within an institution that if we can move this out into the community, we're, we're going to be so much more successful in moving animals from home to home rather than home institution home. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, uh, Ellen, somebody asked, this is, uh, if, I'm not a, if I am not a governmental organization or a contracted organization, what as a private group is my role in all this? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that we need to, um, what we're hoping to do on the AMPA uh, shelter and rescue support page is start kind of start with those conversations and create some webinar uh, opportunities as well as conversation around how do the nonprofits, the rescue groups, and even organizations like Austin Pets Alive, what is our role and how do we not take on the work of the government, but also support our community in the most meaningful way. And I think it's a balance and it's part of this whole ecosystem that we really need to be developing. And, um, and so I think there's pieces of all of this that probably the um, nonprofits will take a, a piece and run with it and then work with the government shelter to do it. But I, you know, I think as we're decreasing the volume of animals that live at the government facilities, then there should be, to Kristen's Point earlier, a, an ability to reallocate and retrain staff to focus on externally as well. And it's of note that Dr. Jefferson runs a nonprofit, non government agency, and I run a municipal agency. And so these really are, um, these really fit closely together because so many more animals could be, when you think about the Austin Pets Alive model and taking those animals that really, really needed the help and needed to get out. So much could be done um, by the nonprofits partnering closely with the municipal shelters to serve those animals that really do need to come into the system because they're medical emergencies or, or other things. Right, that's right. Okay, so I wanna start digging into the new model. Let's do it. All right. So we're thinking that, um, that phase one is really implementing um, so trying to collect as much data as possible and then and we'll have a slide about that and then working on a needs assessment for incoming calls to then direct to one of three new programs and we'll have a slide about that in a second and um, in order for this to be successful the disruption has to continue and so the disruption to the old system, to the institution has to continue. And so there has to be a willful um, approach to not using the kennels at the government facilities to, um, to do the old methodologies. And that's the hardest part for people to grasp because with that, if you have 100 kennels, why would you not use 100 kennels? But I think there's so much more that we could be doing with those kennels. I don't know if we'll have time to run into it, but. Um, but, I, but keep that in mind. We have to keep the system disrupted in order for this to work. And then there has to be really good community communication because um, the people need to know what the safety net is. They need to know what to do next. But so, so Ellen, can we go back to that slide uh, sure. really quick? So, um, so we want, right now, we want to cordon off half of our kennel space for these COVID exposed pets, which, which um, as Dr. Newberry and Dr. Levy have uh, asserted and the shelter vets um, are saying should be housed in the municipal shelter. And they're saying that because 
the, the government shelter um, is the easiest place for people to find their pets if they all go there. Um, they also have to typically have contract or on staff veterinarians who can oversee those animals and people and there's so much unknown with COVID. However, this model starts during COVID but, but obviously won't end there. So as that kennel space isn't needed for COVID housing, it will be needed for other functions that aren't housing stray animals. So we're using some of our space now for community um, crisis relief efforts, getting pets and people care. Um, other ways you can use that space are temporary boarding for people who need to be hospitalized and don't have anywhere to put their pet and are gonna otherwise leave it at home or tie it to a tree. Um, and, and I say that we had, a, we had a man who needed medical care desperately and he, he could not part with his dog and he brought the dog and left it uh, tied to a tree with a little note asking for help. And it was really heartbreaking to realize why aren't we providing those services? Like we are not serving our community when that man had to go tie his dog to a tree to go to a hospital. So right now it's COVID housing. In the future, it's gonna be better services for the most vulnerable pets and people. Yeah, and continuing their legal functions. <clears throat> So survey and data collection, there's a lot we don't know. We as an industry are really terrible at um, looking at data and making decisions around data. And so um, we need to really dig deep and get as much information as possible from the different areas that we know information exists in and try to turn that into um, informed decisions around what these programs look like and what are the resources that we're providing. Um, I won't dig into this too much, but I wanted you to see sort of just some of the thoughts. There's, there's obviously a lot more questions than that that need to be answered. There's all these questions about um, the data that needs to be collected is also um, service related data. Like we're right now polling um, our community and we're asking them what we're doing right and what we could do better during COVID. And we don't do a lot of that as an industry but we won't know all the data we need to collect until we start actually having um, two-way communication with the community. So around foster, it, it, for those of you putting hundreds or thousands of pets in foster for the first time, collecting data um, isn't just about percentages and numbers of what, what you're seeing. It's actually collecting data too of how, you're, how the public feels that they're engaging with us because if the future requires us to do better customer service and work more closely with the public, we have to be, make sure we're measuring whether the public actually feels that we're doing, uh, we're, that we are doing a good job managing things like high volume foster programs and how we can do better. Mrs. Uh, Kristen, do you wanna talk through this? So the way that it will work is that every situation will be triaged. Right now, especially in animal control agencies or open admission shelters, most pets are just coming in, they're just brought in and there's no questions asked and they are entered into the shelter system. And so that all, that is the first thing that needs to change. Um, there are some animals that will always need to come into the government facility. Well, no, I won't say always for now need to come into the government facility. Those are animals involved with um, court cases, which all of ours go directly to foster homes, um, which I hope everybody's thinking about doing. It's so much better way to house them. Um, rabies holds uh, for rabies quarantine, pets that have been exposed to COVID. So those, those are gonna need to come into the government facility. And then there's a, other emergency situations. And this, this is really a range. And over the last few weeks, you've heard us talk a lot about, about essential versus non-essential services, and it can get kind of confusing, but an emergency situation is a situation in which the pet truly needs the immediate care and support of the shelter system. Um, this could be an animal in a cruelty or neglect situation. It could be a stray dog on the side of the highway that's in immediate danger. It could be a tiny little kitten who, we had a kitten the other day who we're, we're really not accepting healthy cats and kittens. Well, this kitten was healthy. So if we just said no healthy cats or kittens, we would have missed it, but it was covered in cactus spines, little like in, in burrs, and it was so tiny and it was found in a remote area. So even though that kitten was technically healthy, it still needed to come into the shelter. So there will always be situations in every intake category where pets need to come in, but. For the others, the lost and found um, stray or uh, neighborhood dogs and cats that are found, 
um, we need to build better programs to get them back home or to care for them in the community. Uh, we're, there's some research coming out of Austin that's showing that most dogs are not going more than a thousand feet from their homes. And it's really when you, if you leave this presentation and really want to like think about something at 3 a.m., that's one to think about because we are essentially taking pets that aren't going more than a thousand feet from their homes and we are taking them miles and miles and miles away and putting them into the institution when we could just be getting them home. So better programs for those guys. And then for owner relinquishment, we need stronger programs to keep pets with their family. And if they can't keep them, we can't just say, okay, you can keep it, we'll take it. We need to help them rehome that pet um, without it coming into the shelter. And this is one of those, those things that everybody says, we're doing this, we're doing this. But when you look at the impact they're making, it's not nearly what it could be if they were doing these programs in a more comprehensive, thorough way, and we're able to focus more services and support on these programs. Yes, and I see a question about the stray dog data that you mentioned, and um, there has been some clarification from Austin Animal Center since that stat came out, and so we'll share whatever they, they put out, but it sounds like it is less than what we thought. We were thinking it was almost 90% were, un were reunited within a thousand feet of their home um, from being found there but it may be less than that. And so we're, we'll get the real data, but still it's higher than the return to owner rate, significantly higher than the return to owner rate in the shelter. And so um, we will absolutely um, uh, share that yes. as soon as we get it. Yes, I, I, just one caveat. I think they're still being found a thousand feet from their home. They're not always being returned, right? A thousand feet from their home, but they're being found very, very, very close to home. Um, yeah. They're sometimes coming into the shelter system despite that. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally agree. And I think we talk about that a little bit later too. So the Getting Pets Home program, this is, you kind of hit on that a little bit. Do you um, want to talk through that? Um, so ahead. yeah, <laughs> I couldn't tell if that was a yes or a no. Um, anyway, it, it is more about trying to make sure that the animals that are being found are being reunited with their pets. And so using tools, creating tools and using tools and so those tools might be um, online databases and you, there's even mapping that is being done in different communities. And it also could be uh, microchip scanning, things that we, that we have at our disposal but the average citizen doesn't. And so really trying to make those resources be more um, crowdsourceable and um, findable by the average member of the public. And then turning some of our medical services, this is harder in some states than others, but trying to turn some of our medical services from internal to external. And so when pets are found, one of the reasons, like one of the difficulties I might have with bringing home a stray dog or a stray cat is fleas, because Texas is terrible for fleas and um, I don't want them all over my house. And so if I didn't have access to be able to pick up a dose of flea prevention, and I would be a little reluctant to be able to take that animal home. And so um, being able to offer this, offer a little bit of support, enough support to increase the comfort of the person who found the animal to hold on to them or a foster to take that animal from the finder. And then um, also creating some support for the things that are inevitably going to be found by somebody else looking at the animal. So really thinking through how do we support people medically and, um, and then also emotionally and with all the tools for, re, for uh, reuniting pets with their people. So what would a program look like that really actually kept pets with their family? We, for the last three years, we've run a pet support program that's kept about 3,000 animals in their homes. Um, and that's through providing everything from fence building assistance to medical care to some rental deposits. It's all funded through grants and donations. But it's a program that is sort of run as peripheral. It's like yet another program of PAC. It's not at the core of how we function. And so what a real successful program would look like is that it really becomes a core function of the organization to do on-demand um, counseling. So you, you call or you, you uh, email in or, or do a chat box. You get somebody to respond in real time and you help them figure out the situation with their pet. Now, for we, we live in a community that struggles with high, higher than typical rates of poverty. 
and people that are often displaced from their homes. And so we're really, really realistic about how many people can keep their pets. Um, but we want anyone that wants to keep their animal and wants to, feels that we can help them overcome whatever barriers exist to them doing that, we feel like it is within our mission to do that. So we're gonna offer them every single thing that we can. And again, we've put successfully fundraised donations to fund all of this. This is not through our operational funding, it's through grants and donations. And we have a lot of this, but we need to do it even better and more comprehensively and have more immediate uh, on the spot counseling. So um, one example, one quick example of what this could look like. Um, those of you who get owners for, owner requests for euthanasia, they're like the thing that breaks my heart more than anything we do. Um, those owners are coming to us because we at one point told the community that the only thing we can do is euthanize their pet or take it in and rehome it maybe, or we might still euthanize it. We told people that if they couldn't afford to treat their pet, they could bring it to the shelter and we'd euthanize it. Well, those days are long gone at PAC. We don't do that anymore. Um, we uh, evaluate every animal individually, but in reality, those people are still showing up, right? They, don't, they can't get service from us until they're at the door with their pet. And oftentimes the medical condition's gone on far too long. So this new way of doing things is really different. We would do a telehealth assessment with that pet owner um, at their home and just find out what's going on with the pet and make some decisions from there um, and get them access to resources before they ever come to the shelter. If it's a minor condition, help them identify potential funding for more serious conditions. Um, and then in some cases, just reassure people because those of us who have that ORE category coming in, we know that a good 50% of those pets are just old or sore or need some, some, some pain medications because they, they get a little bit uh, crickety when they walk. So um, there's a lot we can do from there. And then it stops that constant flow of people thinking, it, the first thing that comes into their mind, my pet is old, it's sick, bring it to the shelter so they can put it down. We just take that out of the um, community culture. Oh, and somebody asked about landlords and people that don't allow pets. So this is another thing our industry hasn't really figured out yet. And one of the things that we do is we call landlords. And most people aren't doing this, but we call landlords and just talk to them about the situation. Typically, there's an issue where the pet caused some problems or they worried about destruction or they saw that it looked like a pit bull dog. We call and we advocate for the um, renters uh, or the owners within the HOAs. And it's actually very, very successful, but we've got to do more on that front. We can't just tell people, well, you're moving, here's your, here's your one piece of paper. You might find pet friendly housing. That's not a public service, not really, not when we're trying to keep pets out. We actually need to walk people through and we might need to provide some ongoing support while they do find pet friendly housing that's within their budget. We, um, we had one, one more really quick story. We had a, a gentleman who surrendered his dog. Um, the dog was super stranger danger and um, was scared of everybody. And we actually had that dog on our euthanasia list and we were able to um, we called the landlord and the landlord said, oh, he's barking at the fence and the fence is broken. So it took us about three weeks, but we were able to convince the landlord to let us provide the supplies, let us fix the fence. And the really heartwarming part about that story is every day of those three weeks, that dog's owner, once he found out we were going to help him, he showed up every single day to see his dog and to get behavior and training support and to learn more about being a responsible pet owner. And it was, it was really uh, a, a, a good sort of dipping our toe in the water on what could true collaboration with community members to keep their pets look like. Yeah, there's so much we haven't tried and it goes back to bandwidth. And if we keep our, if we keep the, the shelter dedicated to the things that need to be in the shelter, in the government shelter, then there's the bandwidth to do these other things. And, um, so I think that's really critical to just keep in mind. We can't do it all because we've been trying for eons and it's not possible to do a great job at everything. And so by, by um, keeping this disruption moving, we're, we'll be able to focus on these things better. Ellen, can you believe how time has flown? I know, I just saw that. Uh, we gotta we move. We are, we're gonna move faster, we promise. All right, yeah. look at this. And so a rehoming service, this is what most shelters are already doing with the animals in their facility. And so this, the flip is that they're not in the facility and they're any animal that's eligible for rehoming goes to a foster home. And so those animals don't stay in the shelter. They're really not, 
in an ideal world, they're not even brought into the shelter because once they get in, it's really hard to get them out. And, um, and then there's a, an even greater focus on supporting those people through whatever it takes to get that animal to a place where it can be rehomed. Some animals need medical care, some need bottle feeding, some need help navigating the system, the database, whatever, but it's a much more customer-centric or people-centric um, support system where we're, we are really leveraging the goodwill of people and making sure that they, they get the help they need to be successful. And then we know there's need with, um, there would be more need with virtual adoption support for adopters and fosters and all the record keeping that goes along with that. And so some of the shelter functions that are typically internal are just, they're just moved outwards. And so um, a lot of this doesn't actually change. So that's a quick slide. And then phase two is um, trying to start doing a little bit more. And so gathering more data and looking at the efficacy of phase one and what are we missing? What do we need to augment for the system? And then looking at this community dog programming and um, really how do we start to understand the difference between a lost dog and a community dog? Similar to, I think, uh, I think there even needs to be more support with community cats versus lost cats. Um, but it's a, an area that we as an industry haven't spent a ton of time on it. And I think it's a place that we could really be successful in the future, just like other countries have. Kristen, you've been pointing out um, places like Cuba. Um, you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it is a, we have to remember that our model of animal sheltering is pretty unique when it comes to international approaches to animal sheltering. Um, I'm not, I don't, um, there are so many examples of people that actually treat and care for all pets in the community, dogs and cats. Um, there's a couple of documentaries about it um, from Greece and a couple of other places, but in Cuba, they had, um, they have dogs that live in different areas of the city and those dogs actually wear little driver's licenses. They look like driver's licenses or IDs and they say who the dog is and they say what neighborhood they belong to. And I think that when we, when we think about this in the US, it's just so foreign to us that it seems and sounds crazy. And you, we've been trying to sort of talk about this for years because in a community like ours, the reality is that many dogs are living uh, loosely owned in neighborhoods. They're going from house to house. Um, and it's just kind of how they live. And sometimes they come to the shelter and sometimes they don't. But if we had a little bit more balanced approach to those dogs, and we really focused on picking up the dogs that are sick, injured, or pose a threat to public safety, and the dogs that we know are loosely owned, and, and most of our, our animal control officers will always joke that they can just follow 90% of the dogs home. That's often true. So if we could take a little more balanced approach to that and start considering what um, what it means to have dogs living in neighborhoods and um, actually not just sort of stick our heads in the sand about that. We could come up with, a, with policies that actually um, account for the differences in dogs, the differences in communities, and, uh, and maybe, maybe, not, maybe the only answer isn't to pick up every single stray dog and bring it into the shelter. Yes, and then this is actually almost our last slide. So we're looking at PAC about how we re-envision our org chart because we, like many of you, have a pretty traditional org chart, even though we're doing a lot of cool programs. And so we've really brought our services down to three areas. The first area is One Health. Um, and One Health is our animal control. It's our all of our field services, our community outreach, and our pet support center. So that encompasses, and the, the goal of that department is going to be to maintain the human-animal bond to protect animals from, situ from situations in which they're in danger and to help pets and people where they live and serve them in their communities, not serve them by removing them from their owners and communities. Um, the second is homes and homes is everything from fostering pets to um, helping people rehome their own pets to adoptions to rescue placement. Um, homes is, is sort of a refocus on the fact that Right now at PAC, 90% of our, our shelter is housed in foster care. So to put that in perspective, typically this time of year, we would have four, 500 dogs and 300-ish cats in the shelter. And that's not even our busy season yet. Well, right now we have 130 animals in the shelter and uh, about 1,100 in foster homes. 
So this, this idea of homes being the second category really says that most, uh, most every pet who isn't immediately served by being in the shelter should be in a home. And then lastly is sheltering, because we, are, we recognize fully that there is a need for many of the services we provide. Many of the traditional sheltering services are important. We took in, in two days last week, 15 parvo puppies from what, five different litters, I think. So we know that some of these services are gonna be needed no matter what. Um, and we are here to help sick and injured pets, pets in danger, um, animals that are in hoarding cases or cruelty and neglect. So those sheltering services, including spay and neuter and other medical care to move them through the system, those are all still really important. But as you can see with this new organizational structure, they're not the center of every single thing we do. They're one of three critical functions of the organization. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, you know, as um, somebody asked a question about um, behavior dogs and how this system may fail for behavior dogs, but I think that, I think we actually fail behavior dogs a lot of the time by institutionalizing them. And I think if our shelters are not so full, we would have the, the ability to have behavioral centers that could be at the shelter, in the shelter for the kenneling. So like you're talking about, there may be a need if your community doesn't have a place where dogs can have some sort of rehabilitation or, or on-site training, then that might be at the shelter. Um, just like Parvo might be treated at the shelter if there's not another place that it can go within the community and, and be treated. So I think that as we're thinking about the use of kennel space, thinking about it as purpose-built um, is is how I'm trying to think of it. So it's not just a cage can be used for any animal, for anything. It's like, no, these kennels are used for rehabilitation and you've actually got people dedicated to that and they're doing a job every day to rehabilitate those animals. Um, oh, our, sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. Um, so I, I just think that that is a, a place that we know we, we as an industry need more work is around behavior dogs. We're, we're finding that, at least here in Austin, the percentage of actually truly dangerous dogs is very, 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 very tiny, like 3%. So, um, you know, a lot of dogs are being labeled dangerous or behavior in our communities because we, are, we don't have the tools, we don't have the bandwidth, and um, if we can start creating that support system, that safety net, then we can help owners that are trying, struggling with a pet that they're having, um, that they don't know what to do with, and we can help that dog have a live outcome by not institutionalizing it unless it needs to have that training. You know, and I would, I would add to that, that it's, first of all, it's a really appreciated question, and I'm so glad that people are using this platform to ask the hard questions. I'll tell you what is failing behavior dogs. What's failing behavior dogs is the current system and it's failing them probably as, as severely as any population of animals. Um, when the ships and uh, dog trainers in, in, when they train dogs for aggression, they put them in kennels like our kennels and they walk stimulus by them. They walk other animals by them and they train them to be aggressive by doing so. And it's part of, those dogs need to demonstrate appropriate aggression um, when they're trying to apprehend a suspect or whatever it is those dogs do. But we're actually, we actually have a system built up to train dogs to be reactive and aggressive. And we know that the vast majority of those dogs, they, they certainly need behavior support. I, know, I love how Stephen Baldwin talks about moving into a therapeutic model for dogs. Stop talking about training and behavior only and start talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and what it means to try to um, heal a dog from trauma that it's been through. So we need to shift our language on dogs too and recognize them as surviving trauma and living, many of the dogs that come into our system have lived in backyards and in total isolation from humans and animals their whole life. We have got to develop a more sophisticated way of, of working with those dogs and looking at them. And so this system would shelter those that um, really do need to be in a shelter and there are some that do for a time, but it would use um, fo trained foster support to get their, those other dogs out. And I, I, am, I am forever reminded of our 19, no, it was our 2014 study that we did. We took 50 youth listed, behaviorally youth listed dogs um, from Fairfax County. We put them into foster homes where the people had no special skill set or training. And we saved 92% of those dogs simply by getting them out of the shelter. And that has been proven true now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more times. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. 
So I think that brings us to the end. I know we have a couple of questions here on the, and just another special thanks to Animal Arts. For thanks, Animal Arts. This. And uh, we really appreciate their support to make this possible. So, um, yeah, so we've got, um, one of the questions is do, and um, Kristen, you can probably take this. Do you anticipate we will be able to get as much foster support as we have now once people are back to work in school? Um, well, I mean, there's, so I, if I'm being realistic, you know, it's events like this that are unprecedented really bring people together. But I will also add that there was no good reason for people to want to foster right now. It wasn't like this really necessarily was connected to fostering. It was just, I think that we all collectively asked at once and the national media picked it up and it made it cool. We cannot underestimate the coolness factor of fostering. Um, and we know that, that fostering is becoming an identity for people and we need to do a lot to help create that. Every foster program should have like dorky, I am a foster t-shirts and hats and swag because people really, they take it on as an identity. So we need to do more work there, but I don't think there will be any problem getting all the fosters you need. We've got to get a lot better at asking and we've got to, if you want a foster pet, you need to have one within an hour of wanting it. Um, we have to take down so many of the barriers that are keeping pets out of foster. And I think this moment of desperation led us all to just pull down all those barriers and let animals go. And that's something we have to continue after this is over. Yeah, and, and I think that it's a, the fact that we don't have gigantic foster programs is a reflection of how much work we put into the foster program. And I know all of us feel like we do a lot for foster programs, but think about how much work and effort shelters put into caring for animals on site and how many people are involved in that. And then think about how many people are dedicated to the foster program on staff. And it's a, a really kind of ridiculous ratio between the two. And so I would, um, I think we just need to think about how it just takes work. There's, it's not like people don't wanna foster all the time. It's just, we're not reaching out and asking 100% of the time. And we're not making it a, a fantastic experience for them when they're with us. So they pick up another animal. So there's lots that we can do. We have control of a lot more than we think we do. And um, we just need to get better at it, mm -hmm. I think. One, there was another question um, about why would why does the municipal shelter have to house the COVID animals? And that's a big hot topic on a lot of our national calls. Um, and just from a medical perspective, there's a uh, the thing you know there's worry that animals might, especially cats, might be able to catch it from sick owners. And the dogs in Hong Kong that develop uh, that actually were positive after being with an owner that was positive, they they weren't, um, they tested negative after 12 days. So the recommendation right now that's coming from all the, the big veterinary organizations is that the animals that are coming from a home where the person was positive, they need to be housed in the municipal shelter for two weeks and then they can be released through normal means. Um, and I, I wanna be really, care really careful in our wording. That is not, we're not talking about animals that might have brushed against somebody that was positive. These are animals that are living and snuggling and spending a lot of time with somebody who's positive. Um, so we, we don't want to create any fear or any kind of influx of animals that aren't in that situation. Well, yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, I think what some of these, some of the recommendations coming out are really being made to um, focus on what, what, what shelters, what government shelters actually can do. And in this situation, there's still a lot of unknowns. We're learning more every day. And this is actually a really, it makes sense as a function of the government agency because of the over veterinary oversight. Um, and because we are still learning so much, it makes sense for those pets to be housed there while other pets are housed in the community. And it's another thing private groups and rescues can do is to take out some of those other pets so that the shelters have room to house the COVID exposed animals. We, we're housing one right now, and, and the numbers are, are fairly low. However, the initial data that's coming out is coming out from New York City, where the earliest, heaviest impact has been, and that um, the pet ownership there is only estimated to be about 25%, and most people own one pet, uh, maybe two. So in our community, the pet ownership is estimated to be closer to 70%, and many people own five, six, seven, or eight animals. So we anticipate the impact to be significantly higher here if we get a number, if we get a higher number of cases. 
Yeah, and I'll also add that the municipal or government shelters were made to deal with um, viruses that spread between people and animals. That's what that's what they're there for. And um, rabies was the big one, but um, this one is a concern. And so we, we have no evidence of it spreading from the animals to people, but we the, that's why the shelters are there, is to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to not um, harm people in any way. So we have a question about um, when we're considering the shelter providing public facing services. Um, first off, I think we need to be really careful about what public facing services as municipal shelters we do provide. Um, we, it's easy to go down a rabbit hole of uh, $2 million of your operating budget going to community spay neuter and outreach services and really um, that, that can be found elsewhere. Um, so I think like for us, what we're looking at now is providing crisis response medical services. And that would be uh, people can make an appointment, they can come into the organization and they can get sort of um, all fixed up. Like, you know, the Wizard of Oz when they're all bedraggled and they go into the Emerald City and um, they meet the horse of the different color and they get all cleaned up. Well, that's kind of what we're gonna do with uh, pets is spruce them up, get them medical care, uh, basic medical care, get them food, supplies, get everybody taken care of, and then refer them to local veterinarians, refer them to pet food pantries. So we can act as a point of connection for people without being the sole provider of all these services. It's municipal shelters increasingly, we're seeing as we try to provide more access to care services, we can easily create a system we can't support. So we have to be pretty careful about what services we do provide and always partner with other local groups when you're providing those. And that really helps, it's helped us at least, prevent some of the pushback that others have gotten from private veterinarians and others. Yeah, and I know we're almost out of time and we probably won't be able to answer more questions, but I did see <clears throat> one that wanted to clarify that, um, and this is super, super important, the number one choice for COVID exposed animals that are living with uh, owners that are sick with the disease, positive for the disease, is that they stay there. We don't actually want them. I mean, the number one choice is the animal stays in the home and um, is cared for in the home. Even if the person's sick, that's better than them going to the shelter. The problem, I think the distinction that's coming out now and is kind of the big controversial subject is that is it, uh, it's, it, it is not being recommended to hand that animal over to a random foster. If a friend or family member. Yeah, yeah. So, so the shelter is second choice. First choice is uh, stay in that home, shelter in place. Well, or or give to a friend or family member who's willing to take the animal. So the shelter is really third. I'll tell you what we what we're seeing is people. Um, I, I haven't I haven't had a loved one with COVID, but what we know about it is that people crash really quickly. And if they haven't planned, what's happening is they're crashing. They're going to the ER and their pets being left. And so that we're getting in a day or two days or three days later. So um, it, around COVID, um, there's probably a million questions about that, but it's, it's planning and it's having somebody to take care of your pet if you're not there. And if the shelter comes because no one was there to take care of your pet and you didn't have that planning, it's likely it'll be going to the municipal agency for a 14 day uh, hold in an abundance of caution. And that's why the shelter has to be empty so that everybody lives in that situation. Thanks everybody. We're so glad you could join us tonight. And uh, this will be posted and shared on the American Pets Live site. So you'll be able to access it anytime. And uh, we really look forward to your feedback. This is a, an idea that's really just being born. Um, and so any, any suggestions or feedback you have, we welcome. And we hope you'll continue to follow us on the American Pets Live Facebook page, as well as, as a member of the American Pets Live Shelter and Rescue Support Facebook group. Um, we're there every single day to, and the, the AMPA team is there answering all your questions um, and, and helping you get through this moment. But uh, out of all of this tragedy, and this is a tragic moment for uh, the world, out of all this tragedy, um, we may find a glimmer of hope for homeless pets um, and, and a new way of doing things that can create a lot uh, better life for pets and people in our communities and our country. Yep, that's very well said. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're really glad to spend the evening with you. And, and thank you, Animards. We love you and we so appreciate you. Thanks so much for sponsoring this. Yeah. Good night.